Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah for this opportunity to be together here on the Yom al Jum'ah. And what I'd like to speak about, inshallah, before we begin is this concept in the Quran. I want to talk about a word here which is khawf. So, kha wa fa. And this word appears in the Quran approximately 124 times. But there are 10 different words, 11 words that Allah actually uses for this uh, khawf, and each of them convey a different meaning here. So khawf, if we think about it, it's a perceived danger and a fear of something that is physical. That's khawf. And we know that min wa min khawf. Okay, so it's something which is physical here. Ru'ab. And as we know in reading in Surah Al-Kahf today, I will not read all of the Arabic because our time is short here. But here, Ru'ab here, on this verse, Allah says in Quran in Surah Al-Kahf. And if you have seen them, you have turned away filled with fear. This Ru'ab here is a overwhelming fear uh, of terror which impacts your ability to reason. This is Ru'ab. And another Wajaf is used here. It's a fear mixed with discomfort. Qulubwi yawmu idhin wajifa. Allah says in Surah Al-Nazi'at. Khashya. Khashya is a type of fear, but it's a fear that is a result of knowledge that leads to action. So this is khashya. So here, I want to just change gears a little bit. There's a contemporary psychologist that claims that there are only five primary fears that we experience as people. And what he says is that any emotions that we have outside of these five primary will fall into one of these five categories. The first category is fear of extinction, which is just another way to say that we fear death, if you will. So there are certain things, he says, that one is not really afraid of heights, but what they are fearful of as a result of what may happen that causes this type of fear. The second, he says, he terms it as what he calls mutilation. So this is a fear of losing a body part or an organ or something such as this. Loss of autonomy, he says, the third one. Loss of autonomy. And this is a fear of being immobilized, paralyzed. It can be called claustrophobia or something like this, but really otherwise controlled by circumstances beyond our control. And then also it extends to our social relationships. The, the fourth one is fear of separation, fear of abandonment or rejection and loss of a connectedness, being a non-person, non-wanted. And the last one I thought was very interesting. He says the fear of the ego, death, the death of our ego, if you will. And this is a fear of humiliation and shame and something else that kind of you know, separates us from others, and he says, this is what he talks about in public speaking, that people aren't really afraid of public speaking, they're afraid of the type of ego death that would be associated with it if they think they make a mistake or something like this. So within that comes two categories that I have thought about, which are fear of loss and fear of change. And if you think about fear of loss, applies to different areas in our lives, losing our income, our friends, our family members, close relationships, identity, health, and power, fear of change, a lack of confidence in ourselves or our abilities, or because we fear change may result in loss and alienate us from friends and family. Now, how I thought about this fear was really thinking about examples in the Quran. And what was the result of fear? And I thought about this in terms of if we look at the Anbiya and we look at the Prophets والسلام, and we take the Prophet Muhammad first and foremost and we look at the response of the nation of the Quraysh to his da'wah is really one of fear of economic loss. And as Imam Zaid says, there's nothing new under the sun. They're coming to him with a plan that 
We actually will worship what you worship for a year, and you worship what we worship for a year. But we're not going to have this reality where the potential loss with, that we will incur from the economics of this. And I'm just kind of par paraphrasing here in time. But also here, we have the poem of Nuh, alayhi salam. If you think about this and being pushed out, and each of them are from Aqriba, the people that are close to him, to them. So what type of fear would be instilled in people that even those that are close to you? And I thought it was really interesting here in the verse when Allah talks about the explanation of the rejection of Qom Nuh. And this is one of our teachers brought out for us where he says, Allah says in the Quran, what, 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 fi adhanihim, that they put their, their fingers into their ears. And one of our teachers said you have to be very... Uh, spend some time in thinking about that because what he said is that the human being can only put their fingertip into their ear They can't put their fingers into their ear But Allah uses this example to show the intensity of the rejection of the letter But these are people the Risala the message from Allah and these are as I said these are people that are close You think about the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam these are the people that are close to him, such that, right, uh, 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 Nimrud calling for the fire and such as this. And then Musa, alayhi salam. Now this verse, this is here. وَقَالَ فِرْعَوْنُ ذَرُونِي أَقْتُ الْمُوسَى وَالْيَدْعُ رَبُّهُ إِنِّي أَخَافُ أَنْ يُبَدِّلَ دِينَكُمْ This is that fear. He uses the word khawf here. Fir'aun says to Musa, leave me to kill Musa, a'udhu billah. And let him call upon his Lord, for I fear he may cause you to change your religion and spread disorder in the land. Now look at this type of deception. We know the story of Fir'aun and what he was doing, that yet he thinks that calling to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is causing this, uh, uh, the term that he uses here, causing this disorder in the land. And the last I thought about here, our time is getting short here, is this idea, well, I'll leave it here, inshallah. But I thought about this, as I said, in these, uh, 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 if we look at each one of them, that really this concept of fear, and fear of loss, and fear of change, and think about that in terms of what we understand of the prophets and how they were being dealt with. And what I understood from this is that this fear leads to irrational thought and irrational actions, and then irrational actions can lead us to the unthinkable. So as I said, Nuh alayhi salam, his family pushing him out. Ibrahim alayhi salam, his family pushing him out. The Quraysh pushing him out. And we know what the type of the sanctions were of pushing the Prophet alayhi salam out and the, uh, uh, what they had to deal with of being out, living outside of Mecca for that time. And then Musa, as we said, you know, this closeness of, uh, of being pushed out. And then actually what I want to say because we were close in, in Muharram and it made me think about this, that this fear, if you think about the actions of Yazid, the fear that this causes, as I said, to irrational thought and then irrational behavior. That after 50 years of the passing of the Prophet ﷺ, that you'll find taking up arms against the family of the Prophet ﷺ, based on this concept of fear. And what I want to say in this concept of fear is that it comes from something else, in my opinion. And I thought about this for a little while. And then I came to this hadith. عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله أو oh sorry عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه قال دخل عربي المسجد والنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم جالس في مصلى فلما فرغ قال اللهم أرحمني ومحمد ولا ترحم معنا أحدا فالتفت إليه نبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال لقد so on this hadith, the Abu Hurairah anhu says that a Bedouin entered the masjid and the Prophet ﷺ was sitting there and the man prayed and then raised his hand and made dua and said, Oh Allah, have mercy upon me and Muhammad and nobody else. And the Prophet ﷺ turned to him and said, You have restricted something vast. And this is the point that I want to close with as our time is short here. There's a concept that is called a scarcity mindset. That's where we believe that there are limited resources. So if someone else is that someone else is having something that we feel that then this resource is not available for you. And when I thought about each one of these fears being being like, what would this come from? 
in the human psyche. It's because I don't think that there's enough to go around just like this man said, I don't want other people to take the rahmah because maybe there won't be enough for me. So the scarcity mindset is something that I want to just spend a few minutes on. But actually before we do that, I want us to think about this question. That if we find ourselves in this state of fear, or if we find ourselves in this scarcity mindset, how is it that we can be there if we are people that believe in la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah? How can we have this fear if we are, if we understand the reality of who our sustainer is, subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then if we understand the type of connections that we have and the type of decree that has been made for our lives, then we would not fall into this trap. It's when we ascribe those things to ourselves and our capabilities and our abilities that that's when we fall into this trap. But if we bring it back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as what has been decreed for us and what has been uh, uh, made available from us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we will not fall into this. And just very quickly, I want to close out with this. If we think about ourselves of this scarcity mindset, it's that we consider limitations of a situation, but an abundance mindset is that we consider the opportunities of a situation. Spend our mental energy on what's lacking in our lives rather than spending our mental energy on possibilities, feeling frustrated, powerless, anxious, angry, and fearful, but rather we should feel empowered and engaged because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being there for us. And when we think about this idea of scarcity, I just want to close with this hadith here. Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, he said, and I'll read this in English here, that the Prophet ﷺ said, look at those who are below you, if you will, using this term, and do not look at those who are above you, for that is more likely to hold you back from belittling the blessings, to hold you back from belittling the blessings of Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon you. Rawahu Bukhari wa Muslim. So if you think about this in this concept, from an abundance mindset, Allah has given us, prepared for us, facilitated for us, allocated for us all that we need in this realm. So the, 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 the idea is for us to move away from ourselves and towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.